give some descriptions about uh, processes involved with growing the snow. snow. Uh, move on to some core high level discussion about how it's simulated with the context and then finish the top apps for kind of the detail that I wrote on the listening. Just starting with motivation, why do you tend to care about this kind of stuff? And it's important in several different fields. Uh, climate science, it's kind of important how it to the Antarctic uh, surface mountain balance. That's really the main thing. That's sort of the main motivation for my work on the climate, the context that we're looking at the time. But it also showed up in several different fields, including civil engineering, the power and natural engineering, the power and engineering, the power and engineering, the snow accumulation patterns uh, by both of those fields. I've got a couple of images here at the bottom of the slide. We're building some of them in Kansas and kind of put an idea of the little bit of the files. Although it's an illustration of some of the genetic factors and kind of the current program So, then we're going to go on to the media and media. It's very basic. It's just a point for each other on the lens at the surface. Uh, the difference between the building and building snow is more of a technical one rather than a physical one. Uh, so it's whether or not this snow impacts visibility above or below is too low level. Uh, and then it's an example of a more broad uh, physical uh, phenomenon called the alien transport, which historically has already been studied in the context of sand and dust. And so a lot of the you know, fundamental results come from the books. And it's very big to of what's early in the country. And like I said, it's just the broadest phenomenon. We don't have to do that in the circles. Um, uh, important uh, interactions or classes of interactions that contribute to some of the topics of these groups, uh, including food particle interactions, particle particle bed interactions, which can shown on a brief uh, particle at the top, the particle at the bottom. And then last, we call it particle interactions, which is shown on the bottom left. Uh, depending on the context of the situation, of the particle particle interactions in the address will significantly impact on the things involved. Uh, but even after the the different uh, classes of interactions, you know, with three distinct modes of transports, uh, largely side sorted. So you've got suspension shown here in this plot, kind of at the top, with the long range, long time suspensions of the smallest particles. And then at the bottom, you can kind of see some of these top three different things, including the example of saltation. And then finally, at the bottom, you have a particle that tends to roll along and go on the ground. And that's what three things will sometimes call adaptation. So we have to produce other kind of little bit of Starting with extension, this is the process by which the smallest particles get transported. Uh, so these are people that are small enough that they can be trained in velocity uh, into the larger moving flow, or they're showing this image uh, even further beyond. So there's a lot of uh, scale that transport even involves switching to uh, the scale. Uh, in the current context, you're not feeling this to be really important. So, so things like climate, the condition of objects, power, and the flow of these. Particularly these small particles like pylon, which is also seen in the process. Uh, but it has a less of an impact on the most important work because we're getting these small particles. So, the salvation, this is sort of uh, the most important of the three modes of transportation. Uh, this is the mode in which we move inside particles, kind of in quotes, to transport them. Uh, and it's defined by this routine for which they motion and it guided in by three or four already solved in the process of detecting spatial components, which is illustrated in this um, image of the series of images of the bottom of the And uh, this is a really critical process. Uh, the tides take on the act as a momentum on them, uh, which is how to move them from higher uh, around the surface into the beta of the particles. Which can result in either further saltation, which is kind of a cascade of that, uh, or suspension, which is like a driving force. But once saltation is initiated, uh, it can really kick off a lot of these different energy transports. So, what are the two slides? Uh, I wanted to highlight that it acts as a momentum bump, and as a result, it also acts as a self limiting process. Uh, so, as you can see in the diagram here at the bottom, you have uh, an initial wind profile. Once that all these different alien processes kick in, and start getting salvation, it results in a modified wind profile, uh, where there's less momentum under the fluid because it's pretty slow at some level in the people. Lastly, uh, the pre processing is, is creep. Uh, this is the process by which the largest particles can form. Uh, most of the momentum that drives this comes from saltating particles uh, because right at the surface there's not like high momentum in the fluid. 
I and even though the scales of motion of clean are clean and low compared to the other three, because of how large the part of the ball power, it does contribute significantly to mass mass. Uh, so as long as we know that we kind of bring in big picture things, um, with that out of the way, I'm going to start discussing uh, how we go about simulating these. Uh, so I have an umbrella overview, the two, the two purposes of interactions that you really have to get uh, in some way represented in the model are uh, the winds uh, interacting with the particles and the particles interacting with the particles. Wind. These are the two necessary ingredients to be able to accurately represent the wind transport. If you want to the other, you're doing something other than a wind transport. Which are the kind of three broader classes or three dynamic simulations you're doing, uh, how you handle these uh, computer interactions with terms. Uh, so for RAMs or LES or DNS, how you're handling these things and how they're represented in the model is going to be really uh, wild. I'm not going to talk about what's handled in RAMs or DNS. Uh, we're focusing on LES for my research, so that's going to be the, the, the rest of the talk. Is. Uh, thank you question. Why are we using RMS to focus on it uh, more than just Scott had one line around our units? Um, it is well suited for us. Um, so, LES being kind of the middle path between RAMs and DNS, you get a bit of the, both, the best of the both worlds. So, you can do fairly those number of cases and larger simulation cases, which can be important if you're interested in different kinds of phenomena that require these larger domains. Uh, and you also get some of the physics that are important that you can simulate better than model, uh, unlike what you have to do uh, But just like in the best of both worlds, it's the work of both worlds. So we do have to model some physics. The penny is generally the subject scale. The part is the one at subject scale levels. And we do have to model them in OS. Uh, and it is more computationally expensive than RAMs. Um, Compare out this both of them out of community. Uh, you can sort of uh, see at the bottom here the comparison between DNS and LES for these power related flows. It's not obviously the perfect match, but it captures uh, some of these features, like the existence of filaments and voids, uh, their readings with more filaments versus more voids. So, capture some important features that uh, do significantly contribute to the physics of the situation. Then we can get to some considerations for how we represent the particle in the in our US code. Um, probably the classifications for how we go about doing this. Uh, you've got the kind of more included uh, approach in IBM with the Eulerian or Bonzian approach or the trajectory approach, where you kind of learn you can kind of like a normal LES method, you can use like a perspective. And then you model the snow particles uh, using a Levantian approach. So, doing this is more intuitive. It's what's with the physics of the situation. Um, to do this quickly and um, to kind of skirt around some of the problems with subgroups that modeling, we have to use a large number of these particles to get statistical convergence. And that leads a little bit as leads into the second approach, which is the random or random approach, or the two fluids approach. So many of these uh, particles, you might as well apply the continuum analysis and treat the particles themselves in the fluid. Um, so, motivated by that, uh, you can develop a two fluids approach. Again, we do the computation on our efficiency of the flex metal and the monomer and that it does that was by some of the physics. Um, again, kind of keeping in mind, we find the target in part of the simulations analysis. So, if we're going to go into the um, I do want to talk about some of the potent cons of these two, at least in the materials and that I did in my tools of the trajectory approach. Um, so, the most of it uh, that it allows for a really tiny detailed representation of the three different types of interaction involved. Uh, you can play around with this at a process level a lot. Um, a lot of the results from these kinds of things are useful in the two fluid approach. There's a lot of different things to here. Uh, you don't have to make as many assumptions. You're, you're explicitly simulating the trajectory of the triple uh, so the flow. The on features being you have a long computation with them. It needs to be done well, and then you have to move a large number of particles. So not only is it covered in track, but you have to talk it to a lot more instances. Um, and then computation works then as a consequence. And I need some of the applications you can apply this uh, approach to. And then lastly, of course, uh, you always are going to get stuck with assembly scale modeling while you're using LES. So you're not going to get it. And for the two-phase approach, 
I have a front dog, it's cheap. Uh, that's the best part about it. It lets you do data simulations, which in some cases is necessary. Uh, and then, of course, the cons are now we have the model, we're going to uh, jump into just see how the product is above. We have to find some kind of statistics out of this and plug that into the model. So, of course, we're to all of it, but we're going to do larger simulations, so we're going to take the two clear of it. The next part of the product we do, I'll go ahead and introduce some of the specifics of what we'll be doing. So you want to use develop an oil and framework uh, that we can use to represent the relevant physics, specifically in uh, Arctic uh, conditions, because that's where you get a lot of catabatic flows, which current theory is really about thinking, makes it easy to target these kind of crazy chat simulations. So once we get this oil and framework, we want to implement that into LES and then try and see the surface mass balance across the largest area we can. Uh, so that's a uh, really good range all that computational efficiency that we bought ourselves with other types of users. So uh, once we get all the simulation down, we didn't want to go and kind of do the thing that everyone else cares about, which is generate the physics based formula for both these plots and sublimation rates based off of our address. So we hope that this is useful to uh, object research. Um, the idea would be to be uh, implemented not just in the Arctic, but anywhere you have automatic cores. Uh, so the amount we space to be is generalizable. And then lastly, of course, no simulation is done until you compare it with the real world. Uh, the details of how this is going to go is kind of on the air, depending on how the beam comes from and what the board just actually ends up getting implemented in the time when we process this piece one. Um, but we're just going to have something to compare at the end. It's far with the blue tune between the level of the one. So I'm going to introduce this schematic of our approach. This is sort of everything we have put into one nice image. So we go through all of the parts of this one at a time, starting with this red line, the catabatic wind profile. So this is why we're choosing to do simulation in the Arctic setting. This is uh, really common in boats in the Arctic mass balance, our surface mass balance on a very poorly represented using one of the cloud similarity theory. Uh, which makes it really ideal to target like I said earlier. Um, and this catabatic wind profile uh, should be able to be captured depending on the surface slope parameter. That's uh, output down there at the bottom. Um, so based off of the surface slope, we should be able to uh, use these catabatic wind profiles and see how they interact with particles. And then speaking of the we have presented in this approach. Um, we have two distinct layers, sort of right at the bottom in blue is the saltation layer, and everything above that is the suspension layer. And then I do want to highlight that we're trying to know there, but this lowest grid point of the LES is above the uh, saltation layer. So this is clearly going to have to be modeled. Um, we've got ideas about how to go out doing maps, and there's some uh, results in the literature that we're going to be taking advantage of for that. The whole process of this is there's a lot of things that we're going to be modeling. Um, the last thing on here is particle size distributions. Um, so this is kind of an uh, important uh, idea here that we're going to be leveraging uh, some big microphysics analogies on how we can handle these particle concentrations. So the idea is, I'm going to into more detail on the next slide. Uh, by leveraging the evolution of the scalar concentration of uh, the in the same way that we do particle size distribution in the uh, microphysics schemes, uh, we can reduce the computational cost to do these models. So this is another one of my favorite kind of big simulation. So what I mean by that, uh, focusing in on the scale of concentration and the uh, suspension layer, because that's where we're actually going to be uh, uh, figuring these kinds of things. Uh, we have this equation, which uh, will determine how the components in each of the bins evolves uh, in each of these cells. So what I mean by that is, uh, looking at this red, uh, we can hear that each of these bins is going to be able to calculate sort of how they evolve in time, considering movement change, this is this first term, second term being evection, and note that we have uh, all the velocity, so we're also accounting for uh, segmentation in that term. 
And then the first term on the right hand side, the third term overall, is our advanced human media space. So this is where a lot of like the microphysics comes in. Um, uh, the app that all we're really going to be considering is uh, sublimation and particle particle processes, rather than particle particle interactions. I think there's good justification for that. But I was illustrated, and that's what we expect. Kind of theoretically, we're talking about a kind of inner particle type of condition uh, through a particle overall. So there's good reason to expect that human and human interactions uh, as far as particle particle overall. It's suspension. Uh, neural terms are subgroup scale modeling and then the source and uh, sync um, on the salvation layer. The problem to match is how are we going to handle the salvation layer? Uh, so I found light on the details that you're curious on where to have to discuss that in the QA section coming up. Um, I think the salvation layer is going to be entirely below that and the lowest level of the IDS. Uh, like I said, this has to be modeled. Uh, and the kind of key things that we're expecting from the model that we need to produce are lateral transport, or in our studio mass labs, and then the vertical transport, so we can use that as a source transfer, the lowest uh, level of the suspension layer. So those are kind of like critical things that we're trying to be able to get out of the salvation layer model. And the last one I would kind of on explicitly here is the uh, momentum coupling approach that we're going to implement. Uh, this is not a fundamental requirement that it's just the first thing we're going to do is only have momentum being two way coupling the salvation mode, which we model that, which is nice. Uh, and then the justification for not having a two way coupling on the suspension layer is because uh, there are no live particles up there, there's some even more particles in the salvation layer. Um, and then if it turned out that the problem is to get strange results with always looking at us and the offers a potential comparison of how sensitive these processes are to us. And so that's the last comment I made. I want to thank everyone for your attention and write any questions. So that's all mostly contained in the uh, vacuum firm and in the salvation layer models. Uh, it is a significant context, especially in uh, salvation layer. Um, I know that we important a lot of that information out of some results previously uh, from the alien transports, um, but I don't actually know the details off the top of my head. Uh, maybe it's point five or so on the salvation because we are affecting how much of that one that ends up only funding the argument to know. I would agree to that I don't actually know the detail about my head, so I don't know why I did that. I don't know off the top of my head. I, I'm quite, and I think how they're going to be doing this with just as soon as it starts. Uh, it's they're introducing a lot of complexity. A lot of this research has been building on like mono dispersed carbon population. So introducing like almost nothing to do with the dispersed power of the 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 power of I would say it was sad that we did it for the best. So, what? For and let's explain to avoid uh, the articulation that you need to use a nice space to do the model without having to worry about a lot of that stuff. Uh, but for three people and like mountainous conditions, 100% have to be accounted for. And then, again, drawing from this failing transport uh, backgrounds, there's been a lot of consideration about the effects of cohesion as far as chemical changes in 
uh, matter. So I know that it's something that someone has thought about. I don't know what their thoughts are on it. Uh, I'm just going to expect it to be important, especially because you have this question of the onset of saltation. So if you have an ultimate event, you expect to be considerably more um, speed and each be able to entrain in those particles because you have a protein zone effect. Um, it's probably kind of best as good as I don't know that. Yeah, so things you can have a really extreme wind events with the result of significant saltation heights. Um, I think I scaled in so high that I think we can do a certain symbol always be there. Um, but the periodic conditions, it's not the only thing possible for it to be significantly higher. If you're looking at a smaller scale, such as smaller grid space, and you could end up in the yard, that is more than that with the saltation from action, simulating a couple of those nodes. So, depending on the method, you're going to be very good at the level of 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 the level